Well, hello. I'd like to extend a warm welcome from Ventura, California to today's webinar sponsored by DHL and hosted by WebAttract, the leader in thought leadership webinars. My name is Lori Dearman, Executive Webinar Producer at WebAttract, and in just a moment I'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders as today's webinar is about hearing from these supply chain experts as they share how plug and play can be a powerful engine for profit, uh, Johnson Control's journey to supply chain excellence through standardization, and they'll share some steps that you can take to benefit from plug and play. We have invited you, along with over 400 attendees registered across 30 countries, representing a variety of industries. Now, regardless of your industry or your location, we're confident that you'll find today of value. I would like to get us started um, with a quick interactive poll. I would love to hear from each of you. How many supply chains does your global organization have? Let's take a look. So it looks like 12% uh, of you saying uh, just one. 32 are in the 2 to 5 range. 21% uh, of you are in the 6 to 10 range. And the majority here, 36%, are saying 11 or more supply chains within your global organization. So I um, really appreciate you taking time to weigh in on that. And I know that uh, these poll responses help our presenters uh, as they present uh, throughout today's program. So um, we'll be starting off today with Lisa Harrington, our first presenter, and then hearing from Gary Keatings and Frank Borath, and I'll introduce each of our speakers as they appear in today's program. So let's go ahead and get started with Lisa. Now, Lisa is a Senior Research Fellow at the Supply Chain Management Center, uh, Robert H. School of Business. and. Um, at the University of Maryland and a former faculty lecturer in supply chain management. She's also the president of the L. Harrington Group LLC, a firm providing strategic research and consulting services across global supply chain strategy, operations, and best practices. Her articles have appeared in major business and supply chain publications around the world. Um, Lisa, welcome to the webinar. It is fantastic to have you here with us today. Well, thank you, Laurie. It's fantastic to be here. And I really want to thank everyone in the audience for taking time out of your day to share this with us. So I'm going to talk um, first, set the stage for why we're here today and why we care about this topic. Um, it, it seems to be a very hot topic, judging by the number of, of registrants we have in the webinar. So that's a good thing. Um, I'll start out first telling a story, and that's the story of what happened when HP and Compaq merged in uh, 2001. When they merged, they ended up with something like 25 different supply chains, and everybody acknowledged that that was just an unreasonable number of supply chains and was uh, was hugely costly and hugely cumbersome. So they set about trying to figure out how they could whittle that number down and they rethought everything and basically looked at their supply chains from a standpoint of what's common among them and can we take those commonalities and build supply chains along the commonality path. So doing that, they were able to cut their number of supply chains down to five. And that translated into hundreds of millions of dollars of savings for for the merged company. And in those five supply chains, they standardized their processes to a tremendous degree. So that's where the savings came from. And then I have a second example, and that is um, Unilever. Unilever has been following the same path of standardizing its supply chain, and it's paying off. I don't have any money, uh, money figures, but on the Gartner top 25 supply chains in the world, um, in 2012, um, they were uh, number 10 on, on that list. And last year, they made it all the way to number one. And they attribute a lot of that to standardization. So what are we looking at in this slide? Um, DHL funded a research study, which we conducted, of about 350 um, supply chain executives all over the world. And what that study, we asked about how many different supply chains they had. And you can see here, the majority had 32% 32 had 
at least 10 supply chains. And that kind of um, melds with the poll that Laurie just, just went over. Probably the, the bigger number, though, is the one on the left. And that is the 42% of respondents say they definitely plan to reduce the number of supply chains over the next three to five years. So that was a big takeaway, we felt, because it means um, people are really thinking hard about how they can be better, and, and reducing the number of supply chains is one way. So why are they doing that? Why do we want to reduce the number of supply chains or, and or standardize how they operate? Uh, there are pretty, pretty straightforward reasons. One is, is um, non-standard, one-off, and multiple supply chains get to be very high cost. Um, and the cost comes from all the redundancies in, in the supply chain itself, but also from the um, myriad different um, approaches, processes, um, structures for those supply chains. So again, going to the one-of-a-kind versus a standardized one, one-of-a-kind, to have multiple one-of-a-kinds is always very costly. The second is they're cumbersome. So non-standardized supply chains um, are, are tricky to move. It's sort of like moving, trying to uh, change course and quickly for a, uh, a gigantic oil super tanker. It just can't be done. And in this age of internet and instant gratification for all your customers, this lack of agility ultimately affects how competitive your company can be. And the third big reason is that um, non-standard or one-off supply chains are very risky. Uh, they're highly complex, and any time there's complexity, there, there's the danger that um, things will occur because of that complexity that, that really uh, harm the supply chain, harm the service it, it um, provides, and ultimately could lead to quality and performance failures, which opens the door for your competitors to step in and steal market share or what have you. So um, those are the three, three big reasons. And again, going back to the DHL survey, the survey found that 69% of companies are pursuing standardizing their supply chains. So that's a, a, a great majority. Um, so again, clearly this is on the radar screen for a lot of people. So now I'm going to say, um, explain what exactly the plug and play supply chain is. It's a pretty straightforward concept. And that is that you create these, this core of standardized, easily replicated supply chain solutions um, that are augmented or, or added onto by these standardized bolt-on components. So if you look at the diagram here, you see the blue, bo blue boxes would be the, uh, the core standardized basic. They're, they're the foundational elements that are similar across all, all of these four supply chains. And then you start adding the bolt-ons, which are these different colors. And you see you have different colored bolt-ons to different degrees in each of these supply chains. And these, are, again, are also standardized. So nothing here is about having one-off of anything. Um, the core solutions uh, done well and executed effe effectively uh, should satisfy about between 70 and 80 percent of, of a company's requirements in a market segment or a customer channel or what have you. Um, so there are two basic foundations for uh, this plug-and-play supply chain. Uh, it's built on smart segmentation and standardization. And you've heard me talk a lot about standardization. The segmentation piece of it is really foundational. That, that becomes the strategy, the underlying strategy for why I have four supply chains here. And, and we've all heard about segmentation for years, but what's smart about it now is, is that we have analytic tools that give us real granular information as opposed to aggregates and generality information. So, so you can really start to harness the big data and the analytics that are now available to supply chains and apply them 
in creating this plug and pl play supply chain foundation. And then standardization, um, we uh, basically talked about that. So it's all about um, creating these templates, these, these foundational elements and supplementing with appropriate ones, which, which also are standardized, but may be um, uh, sort of tailored to a specific market or, or like a regulatory um, framework, as in the life sciences sector, um, tax reasons, uh, you know, emerging market issues. So all of those would be the bolt-ons that um, that help um, fill in whatever gaps that the, the blue, the 80% does not fill in. So Laurie, I'm going to turn it back to you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. And I, I know you'll be coming back at the tail end to, to uh, help us wrap things up today. So see you then. Uh, OK, thank you. All right. Folks, before we bring on our second speaker, I do have one more poll for us to go through. And we would love to hear from each of you. How far along is your organization in implementing a plug and play supply chain? And your options are, we have, uh, we've already implemented a plug, and pl a plug and play supply chain as part of our global supply chain strategy. Um, we've just started developing the building blocks for a plug and uh, play supply chain. We're considering developing the building blocks and implementing a plug and pl uh, play supply chain as a pilot. Uh, we've not yet considered a plug and play supply chain or perhaps a plug and play supply chain is not for you. Okay, looks like 12% uh, having implemented, 22% uh, developing building blocks, 18% are in the considering phase, and uh, 47 have not yet considered a plug-and-play supply chain and uh, got just 1% feeling like it's not uh, for you at the moment. So um, fantastic input. Appreciate you sharing it with us. And our next speaker for today is Gary Keatings. And Gary is currently the head of the Global DHL Supply Chain Solution Design Center of Excellence. The Solution Design Center of Excellence is responsible for building and deploying a global platform of processes and tools to support best practices and solution design methods, as well as research into future trends. Uh, Gary also re has responsibility to build and share user design teams uh, in India to support the deployment of these new advanced service solutions and has written several internal and external white papers on supply chain management future trends. So, uh, Gary, welcome to the webinar. How are you today? I'm feeling good, Laurie. Thanks for the introduction. Absolutely. And folks, Gary is going to share his experience with DHL's process working with customers to build out and execute a plug-and-play supply chain model. So at this point, over to you, Gary. Thanks very much, Laurie, and uh, uh, thanks everyone for joining today. I'm interested to hear your feedback and questions as we get going on this. So as, uh, as Lisa's done a nice job teeing us up to explain a little bit and get us in, all on the same page about what we mean by the term plug and play supply chain, I wanted to take a little, uh, a little bit deeper now and talk for a few moments a little bit about the how to how to design and execute plug and play supply chain and share some of the experience that uh, that I've had and we've had at DHL in doing that. Uh, my role in a nutshell is basically working, with, uh, running a series of programs which are built around building a new target operating model uh, that we can we can operate as DHL and allow uh, our our customers. Uh, in a, we're building this customer-centric program which is about having the capability to design and execute plug-and-play supply chains on their behalf and uh, so I'll talk in the next few minutes a little bit about how we're, do, how we're building these building blocks, some lessons learned from previous projects that I've worked on and a little bit about the groundwork about how our user base are tapping into this library of plug-and-play supply chains we're building and then I'll wrap up with just sharing some some key uh, success uh, 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 topics that allow us to, to deploy these plug-and-play supply chains. So uh, 
uh, if I go into my first slide, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, building on what Lisa said, which is the idea that our goal is to simplify our life, to simplify our supply chains, and to avoid and move away from a, a perhaps legacy patchwork quilt of one-off supply chains and build uh, and, and stop short of building a fully standardized supply chain, but find the right balance, find this uh, Pareto 80-20 balance of having as, ma as many standardized uh, uh, steps in the supply chain as we can, but build out these, uh, these bolt-on uh, uh, optional variants where that's required. And we really see a, a quite a simple uh, three-step method that allows us to do that. You know, the first step is to is to, is to look at the as is supply chains in total, identify all these supply chains in detail and map them out, both the operational processes and the systems, so that we really understand from a baseline and from where we're starting. And then having done that, build out a 2B model which reuses the most common steps and elements and seeks to eliminate and identify these redundancies uh, and, 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 and pare down as many of the possible variances that we can. And then the third step in the first phase of the design is to really map out these, 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 these processes in principle and test them. Test them with the users, the business owners who run these supply chains and identify exactly where we have the right balance of standardized solutions along with these optional bolt-ons. And so the final step, as Lisa said, was to get to the point where as an end result we've got a design on paper and we've, and we've really got down to the level of detail that allows us to assess the cost of operating these supply chains at the segment segmentation level that we want to get to. Uh, and then the next step I wanted to do was just to illustrate this a little bit more by, uh, by examining a bit of a case study uh, and, and sharing some implementation uh, war stories that I've picked up over the years. And this example here that you see on the right hand side is a is a is a is a illustration of an example of a supply chain which where uh, where I was running a project to do to do plug and play. And as you can see the individual steps all the way from uh, this is an I2M supply chain for a, a major uh, telecoms co company in the past which was running uh, nine factories from 70 different origins across 200 different vendors. And, and, and we had to pick material up from that vendor and drive, deliver it all the way to, to line side in the production line. And the way the, the way, and each of these individual process steps is backed up with a, a full operational SOP with process and systems details to explain how they worked, which is the level of detail that you need to get to. And where you see the bold areas, that's the areas where we identify the 20% of processes or so which had to be customized to the local to a local variant normally because of legislation, uh, systems requirements, changes in local service requirements, etc. So there was really three key, three or four key lessons learned that I've picked up from, from my uh, experience of, of deploying these. The first one being that you have to do this really detailed gap analysis from the current state to the future state and really understand how big the change and the transformation is going to be so that it can be properly planned and executed. And having done this critical analysis of each step, you have to force yourself to really challenge uh, and, and minimize the amount of, of, of critical variance and bolt-ons uh, in order to make the change uh, manageable and the value created as great as possible. And the best way to do that in our experience is to have a dedicated team that delivers, that designs and delivers this change for all these supply chains. Bearing in mind this can be a multi-generational project which can take years, not months, depending on the scope and the ambition. So you have to commit long term to a dedicated team, but these guys have to work very closely with their local business owner counterparts to really drill down and get the and get the bolt on details right each time, each time you implement the change. And finally, uh, the, probably the biggest learning that we've had is that designing a change to a plug and play supply chain as a, as a means, as, a, as, a, as an end in itself is, is a tough sell. And where you can link this and leverage a major business transformation, uh, something that you want to change in your customer relationships, or, or so where you want to make a change to the payment terms for materials or introduce new products, if you can link that to a business transformation, it's really going to optimize your opportunity to be successful. Uh, 
The third point that I wanted to go through was just a little bit about more detail about how end users can tap into this into this plug and play supply chain. And what we've done in, in DHL is that we've built up a library or a database. We've taken advantage of the fact that we have uh, really unrivaled access to thousands of supply chains, customers, data, warehouse data, transportation operational data across sectors, different, different geographies, really the volumetric and parametric data. And we've built that data into a, a major, uh, what you might call, business solutions uh, library. Uh, it's a robust template that, that allows us to see where the best practice is and, and compare peer to peer and make searches to see where we're operating you know, with similar supply chains for different customers. And the trick that we've been able to do is to be able to run peer to peer searches. And if, you, if we map a supply chain uh, out and we can map it against the existing database and we can see where, where, we, where we do not have to reinvent the wheel, where we can where we can, uh, we can copy and paste, basically, and derive value by reusing and therefore reducing our return on investment. So this is a journey that we are on. The results are quite early, but they're very promising. And on the right-hand side there, you see that some of the results we've been able to get have been very startling. We've been able to reduce, uh, along with this, along with some other initiatives we're running in combination, we've been able to reduce lead time startups to, to supply chain cost of change and, and time to change and effort to change dramatically, thus eliminating risk. And uh, we've seen real business, positive business results for our, our clients and ourselves when we've done this. So just to wrap up and uh, just to close out, uh, uh, there, there are five key takeaways that I've got for the design and, and, and execution piece. Of, of plug and play supply chains and they're relatively uh, uh, obvious you might say but they're, they're definitely worth 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 calling out. The first one is to make such a massive change in your supply chain you need sell sea level buy-in. You need to put your best people on it. You know this is hard work, it requires investment of time and an investment of some of your good people. Uh, secondly, it's it, this is big organizational change management so you need to professionally support that. Both from a project management point of view, you need to put good project managers and really robust project PMO on this, as well as the soft side, the people side. There is big resistance to change here, and you need to communicate early and often and get people on board with this project. And that's why the third point is link, uh, link this to, to a robust business case for change. Really really sell the message that you're not doing this because it's a neater supply chain, you're doing it because it has customer-centric positive business results and it's going to hit the bottom line in terms of pro profitability. And that's why the fourth point is high quality accurate data. Because if you want to speak knowledgeably about the fact, about the difference that this, this transformation in supply chain can make, then you have to have the numbers to back it up. And you need to be able to see at geography level, at country level, at product level, where this is making an impact and where, 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 it's, where you're seeing results. And then finally, to close out, the final point is the continuous rigor required. You know, if this is a multi-generational project that you're running on a large scale, it's going to take a long time. You're going to have to continuously communicate, keep selling the message, keep have people keep the faith. You're going to have to keep training. That you know, employee churn means that 20% of the people that you, you you put on this project might have moved on by as the project moves on. So you need to keep refreshing the talent and putting new good people on it, using it as a way to, 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 to develop and, and develop and, and, and stretch your talent. Uh, and so I think that's me finished and I'll pass now back over to Laurie and she'll give us another another one of our polls. All right. Thank you so much, Gary. Excellent presentation and we'll have you back for the Q&A. And uh, folks, as promised, do have another opportunity to weigh in today. Question here is, implementing a plug-and-play supply chain would be challenging for my organization because, and uh, got your options there, lack of data analytics and visibility, lack of executive support and buy-in, siloed organization, lack right supply chain partners perhaps to execute, or perhaps you feel ROI is too long term. 
All right, let's go ahead and take a look. Okay, looking here like we've got 45% uh, saying lack of data analytics and visibility. And we've got 26% lack of executive support and buy-in. 54% siloed organizations. 28% lack the right supply chain partners to execute. And 21% saying ROI is, um, is too long-term. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and hide that poll. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our third speaker for today, Frank Borath. And now Frank is the VP of Global Supply Chain at Johnson Controls, and he's responsible for the supply chain transformation globally. Frank leads the development and implementation of an enterprise-wide supply chain excellence strategy to support enterprise goals to deliver world-class performance. The focus is to build end-to-end -end supply chain capabilities, focusing on people, process, metrics, and technology, and to lead the global supply chain excellence transformation. In addition, Frank is responsible to build and establish a global supply chain excellence academy for the execution of global supply chain talent management program. Frank is part of the global executive leadership team at Johnson Controls, and um, Frank will be talking about Johnson Controls' journey to supply chain excellence. So he'll be sharing that with you today. So Frank, fantastic to have you here all the way from uh, Germany. Welcome to the webinar. Yeah, thank you, uh, Laurie, and um, also it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to the audience. So I'm going to talk a little bit about us as an organization, Johnson Controls. You mentioned, Laurie, the journey we are on, and it's it's a real journey. Um, and before I go there, I just want to repeat a little bit what I heard so far. I talked, um, we, we heard about long-term commitment commitments, multi-year multi journey, we, we, we heard about smart segmentation, we heard about standardization, we heard about uh, building blocks, uh, plug and play as a differentiation to be successful, to reduce cost, but also to become an uh, enabler for growth. Uh, we heard about big change management, an organization has to be ready and see level commitments, um, and I can really um, confirm everything. Um, in our organization, we, we started our journey uh, round about um, a couple of years ago with our um, CEO really stepping in and, and saying it drives them crazy when we learn the same things over and over again. Um, he spoke about, um, it drives him also crazy that we are not in a position to share our talents across all our businesses. So that really um, drove to make a very strong commitment as an organization, which we then, in a, in a, in a way of uh, our goal to become the most operationally capable company which is embedded to actually implement a new Johnson Controls operating system. So while we did that in 2013, we also transformed our businesses and product portfolio and the organization you will now uh, hear about is a new organization which is long term around since 1887 but as a new organization since last year where we have been actively in pursuing our options in spinning of our automotive business where we being heavily involved in manufacturing of seats and interior and merging with a company called Tyco International uh, which um, made a new Johnson Controls um, where we are in two business segments, the one in building technology and solutions, which is pretty much everything around smart home, smart buildings, uh, really providing solutions for that uh, type of industry, but also then looking into the other side of our business, which is uh, power solutions, which is involved in the manufacturing of car batteries, but also moving into uh, distributed energy solutions. 
So now, when we did our portfolio optimization and our journey is not completed on that, we also said we need to transform our operation into a new Johnson Controls operating system. The reason was pretty much also what, what you have heard before from all the other speakers uh, around standardization, around really reducing our cost, but also putting our uh, organization in a position to compete and win in the marketplace and also looking into differentiation. And differentiation is linked to segmentation and segmentation is obviously key if you can embed that into your business strategy and into your supply chain strategy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, uh, how we actually are on our own journey, the way how we actually um, implementing our Johns Control Supply Chain Excellence Systems. I'm also going to talk a little bit uh, about what are we doing in, in details and uh, what the intentions are and what the, the outcomes should look like. So if you're looking into, into our supply chain excellence system, a, a su superior systematic process of capability improvements to sustain business performance and to deliver customer and shareholder value. So really the, the, the strong wording is here to sustain business performance. It is all about sustaining business performance and delivering value to, to customers. The way how we see that is, is really what, what we believe will uh, differentiate us as an organization are a couple of things. Uh, number one, the culture of learning we um, implementing and striving for as an organization, the culture of excellence we are striving as an organization, the strategic business partners, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, two uh, strategic business partners which are a part of our journey, but more importantly also visibility and transparency, and I've, uh, I've seen on the poll before um, th that most um, of the audience today feels that data um, in their own organization and visibility is not ready to standardize, and I can only echo that, that data and visibility and analytics are becoming key if you want to standardize your supply chains. But the way how we see that is really that we focus on, on our own um, building end-to-end -end capabilities in a way of focusing on, on people and when you talk about people it's really influencing mindset and behaviors in a, in a positive manner so that you build success mindsets and behaviors and the way how we doing that is by establishing a supply chain excellence academy in our environment and I'm going to show you a little bit later how we actually building our supply chain uh, academy, but also focusing on, on processes. Uh, standardization goes with processes, but also looks into organizational capabilities to build these kind of processes and to improve, because you only can improve when you standardize and when you standardize your processes. But also, to be able to do that, you need to have some kind of uh, infrastructure and we call that maturity model framework and you're going to see that on the next slide, our maturity model framework and how we actually doing that. But also bringing in assessments and understanding where your baseline is and setting future targets, but also importantly looking into benchmarking and benchmarking is, is pretty much combining the inside out with the outside in to continuously looking into the changing environments around us and bringing best practices into your organization and also having performance measurements and management being standardized through metrics which is linked through, through your process to actually have visibility and transparency to make better business decisions as well as to continuously improve on your uh, supply chain excellence system. So now uh, I've spoken a little bit uh, about our supply chain excellence system. So on that slide you, you see our maturity model framework, which is pretty much the infrastructure I've spoken about. And when you look at our maturity model framework, it is a set of 
principles, which you see on the top layer, uh, a set of objectives, which you see below that, and it's 14 objectives, and a set of enabling capabilities. So in every supply chain maturity model objective, uh, we have built our own content of supply chain excellence best practices, which are pretty much linked to seven uh, supply chain excellence practices, which are um, input, outcome, process, metrics, technology, organizational design, and talent management. All these practices areas are linked to five levels of maturity which are giving us the ability to assess all our value chain networks and then linking that to our future target uh, which we are setting ourselves to be able to compete by value chain networks. I'm going to show you an example how we do that in a, in a few seconds. But before I do that, let's talk a little bit about maturity levels. So when you look into supply chains, and we saw before Paul where we ask about how many supply chains um, organizations are having. We are an organization which is having 30 supply chains. Very highly complex, uh, two businesses, um, we have um, project-based supply chains, we have lean supply chains, uh, we obviously have to differentiate how we serve our customers in different marketplaces. However, when you look into our maturity model, what we know is that to be able to, to really compete in the marketplace, we have to be on a minimum level of three across all our maturity model objectives across all our supply chain networks. Anything beyond that on a level four and a level five is actually a deliberate choice of our organization. That really goes in, in, in terms of what Lisa said, smart segmentation. So the way how we do our smart segmentation is, is pretty much we going into really understanding our customers, understanding our markets, and understanding our supply chain in those markets, and really looking into how do we want to compete, and do we want to compete being um, a service leader, or do we want to compete of being uh, a cost leader, or do we want to compete of being a product leader, and setting our capabilities in accordance to support that chosen business strategy by our value chain and implementing those kind of um, strategies according to what we want to achieve as an outcome. And that could mean that certain capabilities would sit on a level four or certain capabilities need to sit on a level five if the market or our customers are requiring that. So I've spoken a little bit about this superior systematic um, way of improving our capabilities to sustain business performance. So standardization and segmentation is pretty much the way how we go as well. So when you looked into our maturity model framework uh, before, that's pretty much also plug and play where we could de decide to do end to end or we could choose a certain set of our maturity model objectives which we have as critical input. But also as a critical input is really our supply chain or supply chains where you would define, segment, prioritize them, understanding your networks, understanding how you want to compete by, by your network, doing capability assessments, and I've spoken about the content of the individual maturity model objectives and the seven praxis areas we assessing. So that's pretty much what you would find in, in that, which we would call a qualitative assessment piece. And what we have done as well is as well, we link, we link metrics into all our maturity model objectives. We use the SCORE model, which stands for Supply Chain Operating Reference Model to do that. And pretty much what we are trying to accomplish here is really understanding what our baseline 
are from a really uh, qualitative but also quantitative point of view um, to understanding our gaps to develop business cases. Then going through an intensive solution design piece, um, Gary has spoken about standardization and solution design. Um, having a business uh, strategy as a critical input here uh, to understand how do we want to compete if we want to be a service leader. Obviously segmentation on reliability and responsiveness is key. So you have to design your certain um, network with a chosen supply chain strategy in order to, to support that. Uh, that would require different capabilities as you would be in, in a way you would compete being a cost leader, but you would obviously have to have different capabilities sitting on different levels. So pretty much you choose your, your business strategy, you segment very well, you understand how you want to compete, you assess your way uh, to set your baseline and you set your future capabilities and you develop roadmaps, implement them, roll them out measure the same metrics to see if you have closed the gap and you do the same process over and over again for each and every of your supply chain. The way how we see that is that if you being able to implement that process, it can become a supply chain capability and talent development engine because people are um, skilled on performing the process over and over again and it's proven that people will become better. So I've spoken a little bit about the, the process but also I want to just mention that our Supply Chain Academy is a critical part of the overall Supply Chain Excellence system. So what we have done here is really uh, we mapped every uh, Supply Chain role in our um, company to our Supply Chain Excellence maturity model to all principles and objectives to uh, the section of talent management which we also assess and then uh, build our um, curriculum as an outcome of that and you would find in our curriculum individual development um, and training plans for our supply chain people in our organization to mature because an execution of a standardization or plug and play or transformation is very, very much um, dependent on, on people's skills. So in our organization we, we decided that we need to build an infrastructure to actually drive change in our environment and to actually change also mindset and behavior and that is where our Supply Chain Academy plays an important role. So as you have seen also in our Supply Chain Excellence uh, maturity model as well as in the Supply Chain Excellence system, um, you're not going to do this alone. In fact, um, I, I strongly believe that in future uh, you're not going to compete as an organization, you're going to compete as, a, as an ecosystem. I even call that smart connected ecosystem. So we, we made deliberate choices to, to partner with two organizations. On, on the one side we partnered with Gardner which is the premium uh, research company for IT as well as supply chain and Gardner uh, provides a, a very critical input um, not only through their own developed maturity models, also they verify our maturity model which is our own maturity model because we decided to build our own because we wanted to have something which is sustainable. But uh, we also joined forces with a second organization and this organization is APEX and APEX is the Association for Operation Management and APEX owns the SCORE model and which I've mentioned before stands for Supply Chain Operation Reference Model um, and we mapped all our um, capability um, or our maturity model objectives with the score processes and through that discovery we could map metrics and we could also map skills uh, 
and skills requirements to perform a process which uh, became a critical portion of our supply chain academy. So over and all, um, the message is here that we're trying to uh, combine and link our great knowledge inside of our organization and joining partnerships with great organizations from the outside. So as my organization, as my presentation comes uh, to to an end, um, just to to summarize, um, we are on a on a journey of uh, supply chain excellence, and it is a journey. It it takes really strong commitments from uh, C level uh, right up to CEO. Uh, change management is hard. Um, we we learning every day as we go in our organization. We have developed a superior systematic process of capability improvements to sustain business performance. And again, it's not about you know bringing business performance. It's about sustaining uh, business performance. And in the end, we are doing that to deliver customer value and to create an unbelievable end-to-end -end customer experience. So thank you very much for listening to me and back to you, Laurie. All right, well thank you Frank for your excellent presentation and sharing your journey with all of us and um, before we jump right into our Q&A we're going to have a few words from Lisa Harrington to uh, cover some key learnings and takeaways. So over to you Lisa. Okay, thanks so much, Laurie, and I'm, I'm anxious to hear the Q&A, so I'll kind of run through this fairly quickly. Um, you've heard a lot today, so basically if you simplify what you've heard, the plug-and-play supply chain is based on a three-step process foundation. One is the segmentation por portion, which forms the foundation for everything else. The second is standardization, and the third is continuous measurement. And these are, are pillars, but you could also look at this as a circular um, activity because you're never finished. Um, and in our study, we found that um, that is exactly the case with our respondents. Only 16% of them were well along or finished with this whole undertaking. So there's a lot, of, lot still to do, a lot of opportunity out there to go after. Um, again, I'm going to run through these. The, the, the low-hanging fruit in all of this is efficiency gains and reduced costs. The more strategic and perhaps more mature end of that spectrum is, is driving growth. So companies have to start on this end and work their way up to the driving growth and becoming a strategic engine for that growth. But, so that's the opportunity, of, I'd say, the next three to five years is to bring supply chain in fully as a partner in driving growth. So we've heard a lot of ideas and thoughts today and I've kind of boiled them down into six pillars of success. The first um, obviously is about sea level and team member buy-in and support. Nothing will, nothing will work without this buy-in. It is absolutely essential. Secondly, don't wait for a shock to the system. By that I mean don't wait for your competitor to introduce a blockbuster product and steal 20-30% of your market share. That's very reactive. Um, it's better to be proactive in all of this. The third is developing an overarching strategy that guides everything you do so you're all kind of marching to the same tune. Um, we heard so much about data. Get rid of averages and aggregates. You can't do good actionable management on, on um, aggregates and averages. Um, and that, that goes to the new tools that I spoke about earlier. Institutionalize your building block, Gary, blocks. Gary spoke of the library. We looked at um, the diagrams of Lego-like uh, building block models. So, so those become codified and institutionalized. Uh, six, you got to invest heavily in the information supply team because that's, that along with the physical it goes hand in hand with with being able to execute on this and finally as I said earlier measure 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 and and improve 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 based on on those findings 
So to sum up, this is a long-term investment. It's a long journey. It's not easy. And companies are, as you heard, uh, um, not so far along typically in this. But, but they're starting, and that's really the good news, and that's the opportunity for supply chain is to be a full partner in the organization to use this standardized supply chain to really drive growth and profit. So it's a call, crawl, walk, run process, but the rewards are significant. So, Laurie, I'm going to turn it over to you, and, and we can get some Q&A going. All right. Absolutely going to start in with that q and I'd like to start with just a quick discussion among um, Gary and Frank uh, around the top two barriers that we saw come through our poll. And just to remind us all, the, the top two barriers were lack of data, analytics, and visibility and siloed organization. Those were the top two. And so um, how would you address those top two? And I'll, I'll start with you, Gary. Thanks, Lori. Uh, first of all, I wasn't surprised that they were the top two. There's, those were the two that are certainly the avid, that we come across the most. And anybody who's tried to take on a global role in an organization knows that, you know, not invented here kicks in and people are very protective of the sometimes of the legacy systems that they've invested their uh, heart and soul into developing and, 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 and training out, etc. So change is hard. And I would say, if you're asking me how to, how to best overcome these, it's about, it's about having this really clear vision, this really clear statement, and as I say, linking it to some kind of transformational business change. Customers these days tend to compete on supply chains. You know, so if you want to be the best in the business and you want to increase your profitability market share, you have to be competing on supply chain. So you have to convince people that this change is going to dramatically improve their uh, their business situation, not, you know, as they're sitting in their factory in Mexico or their distribution center in Singapore, they need to believe that this change is going to, is going to work and, and make sense for them. All right, Frank, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, <clears throat> I have this one picture in mind, you know, when you when you see people and you ask them uh, who wants change and all their hands go up and then you ask a second question, who wants to change and no hand comes up. So it's pretty much like that, but um, Samba really, um, it, is, it is all about really making change happen in a way of um, leading people through that change. And what I mean by that is you, you really need um, a strong commitment from your organization really starting with a C-level, but then you have to, to reach clarity and, and clarity is really about the destination but also what's in for the individual who comes on, on that journey to reach that destination. And you need to talk also about organizational skills and, and take that um, as a matter of importance and in your organization where you have to have change agents um, being placed in critical positions in your organization if you want to change and you need to empower those, those people right from the top um, to, to make change happen and, and um, have role models and the, the fourth uh, really important element of, of everything is about um, reinforcement and reinforcement comes through different ways uh, where you incentivize change and where change um, be, becomes a part of aligned goals and objectives in, in an organization. So I, I can only echo that, that um, two things are important. You cannot have change in a siloed um, functional um, organization where you don't try to to integrate and collaborate and you're not having change or you only talk change but you don't walk uh, um, change. Um, data becomes, I mean, it becomes almost um, a survival for anyone because we talk about uh, data analytics and we talk about um, how to differentiate uh, by supply chain. So if you don't get your house in order in, in a few years from now on, uh, I believe as an organization you're going you're gonna to struggle. Over to you. All right. Thanks so much. Next one over to you, Lisa. Uh, Courtney's asking, 
you've talked about what's happening globally with plug-and-play supply chain, but can you talk about what you're seeing in the U.S. in terms of implementing this model? Yeah, sure. Um, so if, you, if you're familiar with the Gartner Group's top 25 um, uh, report and you have access to it, which a lot of people don't, one thing that pops up in their top 25 is that the leaders are, are um, in the U.S. and they're chipping away at this. So companies like Procter & Gamble, um, I mentioned Unilever earlier, Intel, uh, Apple, McDonald's, all of, all of those big U.S. companies are working on aspects of this. They're not at the end-to-end -end stage yet, but they've taken on areas that they determine, but they prioritize as this is what I want to focus on, this is what the, the organization, the supply chain organization will focus on, this slice of our business because that's the biggest pain point. So that could be anything from standardizing their di distribution center, inter, inter um, uh, kind of inside the four walls where it wasn't standardized before in terms of processes, or even just reconceptualizing their network to have a, a kind of a codified network. So there is a lot going on. Um, no one has the full answer yet, but a, a lot of the leaders are working on it. All right. Uh, this question for you, Frank. Nick is asking, uh, how do you assess risk in your supply chain at Johnson Controls? Um. That's a very, very good question. Um, risk um, is, is a part of our um, supply chain maturity model framework. Um, and I don't know if you remember, there was a, a picture on the supply chain compliance. And um, we, we have two, two topics um, there. The one is really trade compliance. Um, where we will also uh, conduct assessments with our maturity model as well as our standards we're building them. And the other one is really environment and, and sustainability risk. And uh, it's driven through those two objectives which are a part of our maturity model framework where we're going into supply chains and assessing that risk. And when we have our maturity model objectives, um, and we have our practice areas, we understand uh, what the baseline is when we talk about environment or sustainability risk or trade compliance risk, but uh, we also understanding on what level that um, supply chain should sit and um, like I showed before, uh, level three is what we're aiming for. So the way how we assessing the risk is the one portion of the coin and the, the other one is really how do you avoid and mitigate risk and what kind of standards you have to implement. So to give you um, a short answer, uh, we're using our supply chain maturity excellence uh, framework where uh, supply chain compliance is a part of us to do risk assessments. Uh, Laurie, this is Gary. It's also pro probably worth uh, noting that uh, a friend, a good friend of mine in DHL, a chap called Tobias Larson, has a very good service where he offers risk assessment and mitigation using this kind of plug-and-play model. <clears throat> and, it, and it's also interesting because it uses partners to feed in real-time data about what risks are occurring in the supply chain globally, and he helps customers to plan ways to mitigate and uh, manage around that risk. So. Uh, Tobias could help out anyone who wanted to talk more about the risk side of it. All right. Okay. Well, uh, I think that's all we have time uh, in terms of questions today. But uh, if you did put a question in the queue, uh, certainly we'll uh, work to get your responses. And folks, before we sign off, I, I do want to say thank you all for joining us. Uh, trust that you found today to be of value. A uh, special thanks to all of our speakers today and our sponsor, DHL. So at this point, thanks again. This is Lori Dearman saying, hope we see you on the next one. Bye for now.